Hi everyone, Jess McCarthy here. So imagine being a parent who decides to open a school for your own children. You're just like, there aren't great enough schools around, I'm gonna open one. And then 10 years later, you literally have a global network of over 270 affiliate campuses. So that's what my guest today did. His name is Jeff Sanderfer. So he did that along with his wife, Lara. They started Acton Academy in Austin, Texas back in 2010. Now, since then, that one schoolhouse has really taken off, as I noted. And each year, Jeff tells me, the couple gets literally thousands of applications for parent entrepreneurs who want to do the same thing and open their own connected school um, to act in. Now, I had heard of Jeff for years um, as he runs this this also that's kind of like a really cool creative business school. It's called the Acton School of Business. And a few of his former students who are also mutual uh, friends, they mentioned him to me and just said he's such an impactful and stand up individual. Um, but now having finally connected with him, which was a couple months ago, um, I personally like we, we started to um, go back and forth. I definitely agree. Like this guy is a really good man uh, and I enjoy speaking to him. Now, that's not to say we agree on everything. I mean, for instance, although Acton Academies have connected preschool and kindergarten programs that are often full on Montessori, from elementary through high school, Acton is not Montessori. Now, it does share some big similarities. So in both your you know, you're not going to find a traditional style classroom with the teacher just rah, 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 lecturing all day. Um, in both, so this is Acton and Montessori, you're not going to hear bells ringing, next period kids, and, you know, town of ordering kids all over the place every single day. Uh, in both, you're not going to find bubble testing and hardcore grades. Uh, so there's a lot of similarities. Um, generally, Acton is, like Montessori, it's just radically different from traditional education. Um, you can think of Acton as kind of like a maker school, or at least that's how I think of it, if you know maker schools. Uh, but ultimately, I, I think it's its its own thing. It's kind of its its, its own beast. Um, so Jeff, he was gracious enough to come on, which I'm happy, and to basically discuss Acton. But I should say that this is really, we had a much broader goal. Uh, it was kind of to talk about some timeless themes, you know, say character, what is success, how can we adults help children or learners, as they're called in, in the acting communities, how can we help them to truly flourish in life? So kind of the big questions. Um, you don't want to think of this episode as like three tips to help your child uh, when on a rainy day or something like that. This is the larger stuff. Um, now, if in the end of this episode, you're curious about act and you want to learn more, I'll be adding a link to the podcast page, and that's at MontessoriEducation.com. Um, or you can just go directly to, I think it's, let me see what it is. Yeah, actonacademy.org. You can go directly to that. Um, I also encourage you to Google Jeff Sandifer because, man, this guy is a superstar. Um, all right, with that, uh, let's get going. All right, Jeff, very happy to have you. Very happy to see you because we've got this on video. We'll see how it comes out if we just do this or audio. But again, thank you for coming in. My pleasure. Cool. So just starting, we're, we're still in coronavirus times. I don't know when I'm going to actually air this thing, but we're definitely going through it. And I'm confident we're going to still be going through some type of it. So I just thought to hop in any anecdotes from your experience so far with this whole ordeal. It's kind of been really great to hear, maybe sh surprising, shocking, negative, whatever. There was something that, that came up during this time that you think might be interesting. But yeah, I, I think for Acton Academy... Uh, the most interesting thing we've observed uh, during the crisis has been the seamlessness, uh, the, the seamless way that our learners just made the transition. Um, so, you know, they were actually on Zoom and up and operating the next morning. Um, they were having squad <laughs> the meetings. Um, when you say the next morning, what do you mean when you say the next well, morning? I mean, I mean, so, so we knew school wasn't going to open and we kept school open as long as we were legally allowed. So we, okay. we didn't shut down early. Um, okay. we got an, we got an edict from the county and the city that said, you know, no more school. So we closed and the next morning at eight 30, there was a launch and at eight 45 learners from six years old to 18 years old, you know, had their self, um, guided 
uh, uh, core skills, reading, writing, math. Uh, they got together for squad meetings and set their weekly SMART goals. You know, they had a launch that they led at 1230. So except for being on Zoom, they didn't miss a beat. And most adults were still trying to look up Zoom or know how to hook it up. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, and so we heard that from all over the world. I mean, from from the 270 Actons in 25 countries, we got the same reports. And it was easy, Jesse, to say that was technology, but it actually wasn't. I think it was it was independent, learner-driven activity that you know they just knew how to adapt, and they knew yeah. how to. And I so I, so that was the most amazing thing was the how the all the reports from all over the world were the same. The parents were shocked by that there wasn't much of, there wasn't any transition, it just happened the next yes. day. It's so wild to hear this in contrast to, I mean, so many out there. And you know, it's kind of just hearing you say say this is even more globally or larger for us is like some of us are just waiting around to hear what we're supposed to do during all of this, as opposed yeah. to saying, it's my responsibility. I'm not gonna wait for a government or my mom or my sister-in-law or whoever to say, this is what you need to do. Let me figure it out. So yeah. it's it sounds like the and when you say learners, we're talking about students generally, right? I know you, there's yes. certain terminology, yeah. Um, yeah. but it sounds like they've been prepped beforehand just to experience life and to say, okay, now what am I going to do? Is that kind of the what happened or? Well, yeah, one, you know, one of our core beliefs at Acton is that every person who enters our studio is a genius who deserves to find a calling to change the world. And we always talk about and kind of the key theme of the school is the hero's journey. And heroes don't succeed and become famous. That's celebrities. Heroes get knocked down and they get back up. And sometimes they don't win, but they do always get back up. And so our learners to them, and I use learners because we try to stay away from any language that's hierarchical, that makes me above them. So there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with being a teacher and the world needs teachers. But in our studios, we treat everyone as if they were a genius working at Google or if they were Thomas Edison. So we don't you know, we try to speak at an even keel. But our learners, yeah. um, they, they just they're used to things changing and they change with they yeah. change with it. So this, I'm I'm excited about ta speaking with you because you know Jeff and I we we for the first time kind of met face to face uh, virtually uh, I don't know it was a week or two ago and I just love the conversation very open we kind of had a lot of pushback just going back and forth so I want to as we go along I think we're gonna have a s so much agreement but I want to push back and I'm curious what you will say sure. so sure. I'm this kind of flattening even in in management or business. There's something about it that really appeals to me, you know, this non-hierarchical structure that everybody can can offer something. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not a super religious individual, but I remember there's something with Jesus had this line where, you know, even if Jesus is speaking, if somebody has something more important to say, it's important to allow them to speak. You yes. know, so I I like that. But there's also something that, that kind of pushes back at this and says, like, the idea of calling a child, or even myself, I think I'm a bright individual, a genius seems a little bit phony to me. So I yeah, just want to yeah, yeah. push back and get your take on on that. Yeah, yeah. It's a great pushback. And one of the things, and this is me personally, not necessarily acting, but I always try to you know look for the definitions of things. And so it's easy to take genius as meaning 180 IQ, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what, that's what we think about it. And look, IQ, you know, IQ matters. It's nice. I'd like to be, be six feet tall and have a full head of hair. Don't have it. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, but, but the word genius doesn't mean IQ. It means having an unusual talent or skill. Mm -hmm. And so we believe that every person who enters the door may, not, may or may not have a high IQ. And in fact, we found that doesn't even matter very much. Yeah. But they have one skill or two skills or we can weave three skills together that they are better at than most people. And if they can find that gift and hone it and use it with joy, they're going to climb, you know, a pecking order. They're going to be good enough that problems come to them. And so genius means there's something inside them that's special that they can use in the world to find a calling. Yeah. All right. So I think I think we're going to have it's it's fascinating hearing you speak about it, because as we kind of get into the nuances of it, I can see some similarities. And then as I'm still you know, thinking of processing it, what would that mean for every student to be kind of at an exceptional level and something? So um, maybe as it, as we go along here, something else will come up in it. But um, but I like that clarification because this is not like, oh, you have the highest IQ in the world and therefore you're a genius. Like that is just 
not the way to look at things. So well, and and, and before we get off this for one second, I mean, here's yeah, here's an example for, for you. Um, if you're a great plumber, right? It's easy to look down on an electrician, but if you're the best plumber in Austin, Texas, you're at the top one percent of that curve. You're going to make more than the average Harvard graduate. If you're yeah. running a plumbing company with 20 plumbers, because you're a great plumber, and you can manage plumbers. You know, you're likely a multimillionaire. So I think the great thing about America is, and as we all think about the, you know, the, the troubles we're going through now, there's thousands of these hierarchies that you can master. And if you're just good at one of those things, you're gonna have a very rich life in terms of being able to support yourself and your family. So yeah. that's when we think about it is that there's just thousands of ways you can serve and we're looking for, each of us are looking for the right one. Yeah, I th and I think this is gonna come up because I think we are on the same page, but the angle of saying, because when I think of genius or some kind of comparative, it, it then, because I know ta speaking with you, it's all about, you, you got to be enjoying what you're doing. This is not like, I want to get to the top, be the best plumber in the world, and I don't even care just because my dad wants me to. It's because you thrive at it. So at the end of the day, if you really love something, you put your heart into it and say, I'm going to continue and learn and grow. You're going to get to the peak. You're going you're gonna to get up there. Um, so I think we're on the same page. I just, I'm concerned, you know, today with social media, it's like, I've got to get the most likes. Oh, I'm the genius who gets the most likes. So yeah. it's just, it's just getting to the nuances, but I think we're on the same page. Yeah. Um, in that interim, so All right, so cool. So actually thinking about this, you know, just that you're working with so many children or students or learners, as you call them, how about yourself? Just looking back, what, what's maybe an example or a few examples that had, a, an enormous or big impact on you, or even if it's a small thing, but you re recall it, that you took with you to, to kind of form a part of who you are today? Oh, well, I mean, for me personally, um, I think one of the turning moments, the turning points in my life was when I was 13 years old and I was working in the oil field. So my father made me work out in the oil field doing manual labor. And I was a little guy. And I was a little white guy in a world where, you know, 80% of the people were Hispanics or African-American. And so, you know, little white middle class guys were not in the right place. So out in the field too. the oil, I mean, because let people know the oil field, this isn't just like, oh, I get a little grease on my face. This is serious uh, work. And so we'd go out every day and work from kind of dawn until dark in the summer. And it was hot and greasy. And then one day it rained and it doesn't rain very often in West Texas. So I knew rain days, you got to stay inside. And so we went back to the kind of the office or the yard where all the equipment was, and the older men all played cards. And my boss was a man named Armando, and he talked with a Spanish accent. And he said, uh, Junior, he always called me Junior, come here. And he said, you see that big pile of rocks? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, I want you to move them from that side of the yard to the other side, about a 50 yards. So I spent all morning carrying these like 20 pound you know, pieces of concrete. And I got them in the rain all the way to the other side of the yard. And I went back to see Armando and he came out and he said, oh, Junior, I've made a terrible mistake. I like the rocks back where they were. <laughs> and so I spent all afternoon moving the rocks. No. Oh. And I said that day, I will never, ever work for someone again unless it's my choice. And so Armando gave me a tremendous gift. And I think the reason I say that is, you know, if I, everybody remembers a teacher who changed their life, and it's usually by either affirming you, which is wonderful, or it's by challenging you in, you know, with tough love. And mm -hmm. Armando, I don't think meant to be have tough love. I think he actually was enjoying torturing me a little bit. It didn't <sighs> matter. I got the lesson. And the lesson was, you know, I want to choose my authority. Hierarchy is fine but I want to choose it, not have it chosen. Yeah. See, and this is where the nuance comes because what you just said is beautiful. The hierarchy is important, but you want to be able to choose it. And that's, yeah. so you said Armando, he was kind of like this, this, I mean, he wasn't doing it to just rile you and then be like, don't just listen to people when they tell you to do stuff. He was no. actually trying to get at you. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I would I would love to attribute um, a higher, higher uh, <laughs> reasons from the around of, but I think he was just, now, maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe he was a lot yeah. wiser. Um, but but it, you know what? It doesn't matter. It yeah. was how I took the challenge and what I learned from it uh, that, that mattered. It wasn't Armando's intent that really mattered. Yeah, and I think even you're taking, I've as I've grown up, 
you know, and it matured. I used to, if, if I disagreed with somebody, it would be like, oh, I'm done with them. Whereas now somebody does something, I try to find the sliver of what can I gain from this individual. Um, so I think I, I, I appreciate that story. And that is definitely a learning lesson. I'm glad you got it so young. Many people never get it. So, yeah. so that's huge. Uh, let me see. I think there was, let me see what else I wanted. There was something in particular. Oh, I know there's an overarching thing I definitely wanted to get at because sure. in thinking about this episode, I was thinking about really character development, how to, how we help children or even help ourselves to succeed in life. And sometimes when I'm giving talks or speaking to people, we have a different view of what success even looks like, whether for ourselves or for children. So let's just step all the way back. And right. I know if anybody's listening out there, even think for your, yourself while, you know, Jeff might be answering this, but what do you see as success? What does it mean? Well, I, success obviously is different for different people, but but I want to make a distinction here, at least for, for me, when I think of success, I think about the distinction between success, satisfaction, and fulfillment. So success is whatever target I've hit, whatever goal I've, I've set that I hit the target. Um, Satisfaction is really a weighing of, given where I am today, am I pleased? And fulfillment is thinking about at the end of life, you know, did I become who I was meant to be? I mean, that's to me. And so I really, well, I'm all for setting goals and hitting the goals. You know, most of them found out in most of the behavioral psychology will tell you, you know, once you hit the goal, it's not much fun anymore. It's the attaining that matters. And I want to keep my eye on the long ball. And something, Jesse, we, we do at Acton Academy and at the Acton MBA program are these stars and stepping stones interviews where you go and you find 10 people that you respect and you go spend two hours asking them about their lives. We've done now several thousand of those. And here's what's interesting. People come back and when they we say talk to people that are your age to 30, 30 to 45, and then and then, you know, like older, preferably over the age of 60. When they come back from the interviews with 60, everyone says almost the same thing in different words. And they say, when they tell that my mentor told me when you're 60 and you look back on life, you'll have three questions. Did I accomplish something meaningful? Was I a good person? And who did I love and who loved me? And so I like to think in terms of fulfillment in those three questions. And those are three questions that Acton Academy learners start to ask at age six or seven even when they can't comprehend, obviously thinking to age 60, they can look at heroes, whether it's Star Wars or you know, Toy Story, it doesn't matter the tale, and mm -hmm. they can begin to think in terms of those three questions. So those are the three questions I think that matter. So I, I like this, and I, I'm huge on heroes. I think I even did it, one of the acting conferences that I spoke at in D.C. I do this thing about Montessori and the heroic, because this is, you know, I'm in Montessori generally, but in good education. Um, so, you know, Anne Frank's a hero of mine, but I'm curious, I mean, I have many heroes, but she's one of them just because in terms of uncertain times, she made, she dealt with what she had in, in, to me, a very profound way. Um, but I'm curious in connected with success in times that are non-emergency, like that type of situation. Do you have any heroes, um, whether now or in the past that you look at as like, this is what epitomizes success in all these rain in all these areas that I've just talked about? Gosh, I, you know, I have so many, and and one of my heroes, and Laura introduced me to Maria Montessori, and, and and I actually trained in Montessori and took our daughter through it. So I spent a lot of time reading about Montessori, and and I look for heroes like Maria Montessori that saw the world in a different way, and had the courage. You know, it's easy now when there's thousands of Montessori schools to to, to act like it was going to happen, right? But she she was she bucked against the tide. She was a contrarian. She was brave and she saw something, you know, in the distance and went for it. So my heroes tend to be like Maria Montessori. They tend to be contrarians. They tend to have a new model that's disruptive. And it's not just what, because we're doing that. I think we're doing that because of having heroes like Maria Montessori. So, and, and I, I appreciate that one of the, I mean, I think we're similar in some ways where there's an element of if somebody's pushing back against the norm, um, I, it, I always, I go to it and I say, Hey, what's going on there? Because I'm curious now. And then if it's yeah. a, if it's a positive thing, then I'm all for it. I love the pushing back. So with that in mind, what do you think about, cause I know I've, I've approached this when I was an early teacher, I wanted the children to kind of love the heroes that I loved. There was, there was almost a need to, 
you know, and I even had this thing, even I was teaching fifth graders and I did this whole thing on what is a hero and the Greeks were hero worshipers because I love the Greeks, the ancient Greeks. Yeah, um, I mean, absolutely. they had their problems, but, but then I found that I was being super abstract when what these young kids at that moment really wanted with stories about good versus bad adventure stories, learning about the, the facts of history. They didn't necessarily want an abstract definition of what a hero is. And so right. how do you balance ensuring that we're giving them kind of the reality or the ability to see the truth of history, facts or science or whatnot versus us giving them conclusions about oh, well, this guy was a hero because, as opposed to just giving the data and letting them maybe inductively say, wow, I really think this guy's a hero. Well, you know? and, and I think this comes back to you know, my second hero, which would be Socrates. And, yeah. and you know, it wasn't only that Socrates was great about asking the right questions, but it really was his humility to believe that he was the wisest man you know, in the world because he knew he knew nothing. And I think that's where going in with curiosity and fresh eyes and listening to them tell their stories, you know, and staying in story form is so important. Um, sure, they're facts and facts matter, but if you get the story right and the narrative right and they're wrapped in the story, if they believe they're Thomas Edison in his laboratory, you know, solving electricity problems and electricity that will change the world, then drawing a patent becomes the most exciting thing in the world. If you make somebody yeah. study patents, it's the most boring thing in the world. So I think connecting to stories and questions, um, and, and you mentioned something that we we're talking about turning points. You mentioned something about us wanting them to love our heroes. And of course, that's human nature, right? Mm -hmm. I want, if, I, if I love chemistry, I want them to be excited about chemistry. But seeing that light come out in the child's eyes, as important as it is and as inspiring as it is as a, as a guide or a teacher, um, I think that's all about me, right? If I'm not careful, if I'm not mm -hmm. careful, their, their eyes lighting up makes me feel good. And I, and I have to, that's yeah. a dangerous drug for me. And so one of the turning points for acting was when Laura came home one day and I wasn't even in the studios at this point. And she said, we've got a problem. Um, the guides are having to teach our learners to read. And our whole model was self-learning, right? So I said, well, mm -hmm. we tested the young people. They, they can read. And she said, well, the guides are having to teach them. So we had this conversation for a moment and our son, Charlie was nine years old. And I'll never forget. He was laying on the couch with his feet up on the couch, which is very unusual for him. He was reading a book, he closed the book. He turned and put his feet on the floor and turned to us. And he said, do you mind if I interrupt? It was kind of, it was, <laughs> no. Very was, polite child, by the way, Jeff. But yeah. It was just an odd moment. He goes, well, yeah. you no, know, if I give my, if I give Faithful, and Faithful's his dog, if Faithful barks and I give him a biscuit, he'll bark again. He said, the, the, uh, the eagles, that's our mascot, the eagles are acting like they can't read so they can get attention from the guides. Yeah. And if the guides don't, he goes, they can read words like rough and tough, but they can't read words like automatopoeia. And if the guides don't get out of the way, we won't be able to teach them. Uh -huh. Now, I told Laura, I said, we're going to make teaching like that a firing offense. Guides can never, never again can a guide answer a question in the studio. And that's our rule now. No, no adult on campus can ever answer a question. And the guides pushed back very hard because they loved that human connection, right? And there were times, by the way, when you're, if you're mentoring me, that human connection is everything. If you're an expert, it's important for me to listen to you. So I'm not saying adults can't play that role. Yeah, yeah. Our studios, the guides are not in a role of authority like that. They're in the role of asking questions. And so it's not about the child performing for you to make you feel like a good guide or, by the way, a good parent. Hey, Jesse got into Harvard. That means I'm a good parent. Yeah. You know, maybe at the country club it does, but that doesn't necessarily. So I think we've got to get out of this role of making it about making me feel good as a teacher or a guide um, if we really want to be like Socrates. Man, there's so many things now I want to jump in based on what you just went through. So let me see if, let's pick, okay, so one really quickly. I, I don't know if you know, but Edison, he said he's a huge fan of Montessori. I don't know if you knew that, but he said oh, Montessori no, make, oh yeah, Montessori makes learning a pleasure is one of his quotes. So he's, and for somebody like that, I mean, now he's genius level for, for sure across the board. So, um, but you also said something, I think it was like, dang, we got to be careful that, um, 
this what we're doing with children doesn't become a dangerous drug for me. And I think that's that's not I don't even look at it as like just an analogy. It's it's like a drug. That's what drugs give us this feeling of euphoria, but it's momentary and it's not real. Um, so I know I felt that as an early teacher. So what you're saying is, you know, oh, my gosh, look at that child knows what I just told him to know. Look at it's amazing. And you feel good. And now you're both thriving off of each other's feeling good. You feel like everything's great, fine and dandy. And it's not um, because right. I think a lot of the real learning that you're talking about is not occurring. Um, so, well, it, oh, go yeah, for it. Yeah. yeah if we're, if, well, if we're not careful, that turns the child into an object for our pleasure, right? And then it gets back to traditional schools. And, you know, we're trying to produce productive citizens. And when I hear somebody in traditional education say that, I'm always, do you want that for your children? Oh, no, I want them to reach their self potential. And I want them to like, well, then yeah. don't do it to other children. They're not yeah. cogs in our machines. They're, they're, these living, wonderful, messy, you know, often diabolical little humans, but, yeah. but they're cogs. Yeah. And I, I think the focus on an individual personality, and I think going back to that quote genius that you're talking about, it's the fact that I can achieve something unique in my own life. I'm not just a cog. I'm not just a citizen of this country. I'm a person of the world, a unique individual of the world. So, um, so I think you're right on though. The one thing, and here's some pushback for you. So sure. the idea of not of not answering any questions. So I can totally see where you came from with your son, and you noted you recognized a problem with your teachers or guides at the time um, that many early teachers and even later teachers and even parents, you get sucked into this. I want my child to feel good, and then it makes me feel good, and this this it's a deadly cycle. But yeah. to go all the way to not answering questions, that I give you an analogy. It'd be like Let's say I'm a, a a silversmith, and you know I've got an apprentice, and he's asking me questions about the the swords that I'm making or something. Like the idea of being like, no, you you will answer your own questions. There's something. See again, I'm going to go back to the word phony. I yeah. don't mean to be you know contentious, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it seems phony. There are there are so many times, and maybe the high percentage should be don't answer questions. But the idea that me as somebody who's had a lot of experience in life that I couldn't answer a question and go, hey, here's what I think. What do you think about that? Like, right. it seems like there so, should be some moments for that. Yeah, well, and the reason we have to be so tough on it is because uh, adults can't help themselves from getting sucked into this. So, you know, it, yeah. if, you, if you could control it, <clears throat> most adults, including me, could control it, we wouldn't need it. Uh, but here's what I could offer, and let's go to the silversmith analogy, because it's a good one, because apprenticeship's what we're all about. Mm -hmm. If I'm a master uh, silversmith, what I can do when you ask that is I can say, okay, Jesse, let's talk about why some people love silversmithing. Let's talk about some hero stories. So the why that now, and you've got a gift in silversmithing, and I affirm that, and so now you're all excited. So we're you're going to be a silversmith. Because if the why is not there, like Edison said, nothing matters, right? It's not fun. Mm -hmm. We get past that, and I say, okay, there's a process for silversmithing. Let me give you one of the recipes. There's 14 steps. Here's the 14 steps. Um, here's an explanation of each step. Now, I don't even need to go through that with you, right? Because there's uh, something called YouTube today that you can look at all 14 steps and videos. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Jesse, be careful because there's actually eight different recipes. I'm just giving you one. Yeah. Here's a beautiful chalice you could make. And here's some silver. I'm going to actually ask you to do push-ups, enough push-ups to earn the silver or something to make it valuable. And we're going to play a game to see who can create the best chalice. Mm -hmm. All right, ready? Go. You've got the rest mm -hmm. of the day. So okay. the best way to think is, is a guide is a game maker. Mm -hmm. And so our job is to provide you with a why that has that ties to your hero's journey, some story or, or a video or something that gets you excited. You know why this is important to you. To provide you with a process or a recipe, to provide you with an example. So in the case of a silversmith, it would be like a chalice. Mm -hmm. um, and then some sort of game or rules to the game or ways to keep score to make it fun, to make it into a game. If mm -hmm. I can do all those things, I really don't need to answer any questions. I've given you all of what you need to set up the game. And my number one goal as a guide is for you to become a game maker. Because once you can create games for other people and, and create the society around you and the rules of governance and the things you guys are doing, then I can step out of the way. And I don't, that's why we don't even need to be in the studio because they become game makers. Yeah. So, you know, I think I need, I, I, I'm curious what the audience too, what, the, what they'll think of this. Cause I think there's an element I've seen some of Acton and 
in action, but not enough to really grasp what this looks like. Because the, I mean, for me, again, with the pushback comes for even the game, it sounds exciting, but then it becomes, I don't remember needing, you know, if I got excited about maybe taking something apart and trying to put it back together as a kid, there was no additional need for me to turn this into a game. Who can do it the quickest? What can I, it was just the pure enjoyment of the process and trying to figure it out. Um, right. And if I could get some guidance from somebody who's done it before and says, oh, well, just be careful with this because this can this can trip a lot of people up, but the rest, go for it. I don't yeah. think I would need an extra gamification of it. So that's yeah. that's where I'm coming from. Yeah. No, 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 no. And, and I'm with you on that. And and the gamification can be way overdone and way cheapened. And, and, and I think of it almost more like how a free market society works that, you know, you know, you earn money if you speed, you get a fine, if you, you know, it's not about the money, it's a way to kind of keep score and keep society together. So here's why I think it matters. The second challenge of what we do is to have the tribe all connected. So people have to be treating each other with respect and working together. And look, this is never utopia. It's always messy and it mm -hmm. goes into Lord of the Flies and tyranny. That's part of the beauty is they have to build their community. But you might do silversmithing because you love that and you'll do it all day, every day. But I actually need you to learn to at least read and write a little bit, right? I mean, you can't silversmith all the time. <laughs> For your own good, I see that there's some other things. So yeah. the gamification helps, you know, gamification is the wrong word. It's more like Tocqueville in creating a civil society. But having incentives, both extrinsic and intrinsic, tie you to other people and will get you focused and on a path to mastery in other areas when they get hard or mm -hmm. when you may not be interested. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not as fundamental as the other elements, but it keeps a tribe together working together when it might not be everyone's favorite thing to do at this moment. Okay, so that that's interesting. I think this is a great example of something we'd have to delve a little into with the nuances. Maybe I'll even talk with you later and see if you have some videos around this or anything that sure. might make it a little bit more real. Um, sure. But I, I'm with you because again, like my analogy of say putting that thing together or redoing, that doesn't necessarily mean if I'm doing that at 25 and I'm not doing anything productive with it, that's gonna meet that's gonna be anything positive. Right. Because I well, could be tink I could be tinkering all day and not actually producing anything of value outside of that and be on the streets. Right. So it, well, I, I think that's yeah. somewhat what you're getting at or. Well, well, another example would be though, let's say go back just for a second to silversmithing. Mm -hmm. If you made a chalice you thought was beautiful, but no one would buy it. Yeah. Right. Now a true artist might not care. And you might wait tables to make the money to make another chalice and that's your choice. And that's fine. However, if you wanted to make a career out of being an artist and want to actually sell your art, um, then taking it to the marketplace and getting feedback, you know, would be helpful. Yeah. So it's a better way to think of gamification as sophisticated feedback structured in a way that wants you to, that you'll keep playing when it gets hard mm -hmm. and even disappointing. If you put the hero's journey narrative in with that, it just it, get, it gets people focused for longer on hard things without giving up. That's, yeah. and that's I, really because it, it, it stretches your time horizon uh, so you don't just quit when it gets hard. Yeah, and that, and that might be the way maybe that we're both can line up on this because getting the feedback, whether from your peers or from older, more experienced individuals, whatever it happens to be, man, if you're not getting feedback from other human beings, um, and that means this product or this thing is better, or I can tell you why it's better or was more convincing as a essay, or you're in trouble. So so I'm with you. I think that makes sense if, if that's where this yeah. is connected. Well, and here's another way to think about it. Again, gamification is the wrong word. It's more about society, but we never grade anything. There are no grades at Acton, but mm -hmm. there are high standards of excellence. So this isn't like a democratic school where anything goes. It's the opposite of that. Um, when a badge is approved by two peers, there are standards of excellence. For example, if it's the first time you've ever done it, did you give it your all? If it's the second time, was it better than the first? If you've won a contest or if you've gotten so good that we can pair you to a master, it has to be compared like if you wrote a short story to Hemingway, if you've gotten good. Now, I've got all those standards, but you and I are buddies, right? And you bring me your badge. So I'm going to give you a break and approve your badge, even though you kind of mailed in the work. Well, you're going to do that to me. Well, that's the way the world works. So you're going to get log rolling. Mm -hmm. Except at Acton, 
every session, when we finish a six week session, we ask anonymously whose badges should be audited. Now, who knows who should be audited, right? They know. Mm -hmm. Then without releasing those names, so we don't shame anyone, we at random pick three other names. So now six out of 36 are gonna be audited. Now, who gets on the audit committee? Well, it's all the tough people. That's the only people who wanna go mm -hmm. audit is because they have high standards. If one of your badges is rejected based on those excellent standards, and you can appeal, but let's just say your appeals don't work or you realize it's true, I lose a badge too for approving your badge. Mm. We each just lost six weeks worth of work. So this bit of thinking about incentives and structuring them correctly between people means that we don't have to grade everything. And if anything, what we have to worry about with excellence is their standards are too high because yeah. we've made it everyone's self-interest to do the right thing. So, and then in terms of these badges, is this kind of like, like Boy Scouts, like setting a fire, you get a badge for setting a fire and, and you move yeah. on. Okay. Yes. So th yep. this is fascinating. I, I like that you're adding in these elements of, it's not like your teacher just decide, here's an, here's a big A, great job. That's the proof that you're doing well. It's, you're having a lot of feedback from your peers. Yeah. So th this is what I'm in. And it's funny that lighting a fire came to my mind with this badge, but there's something in me that kind of bristles about it because it's still primarily somebody else telling you if what you've done is right versus like with the fire, which is a very simple example and it's probably easy, is that look in front of your face, there's a fire going. You don't need Jeff or Jesse or some six or seven year old boy or girl telling you, you can see it with your own eyes. So how does that relate with badges and everything really with acting? You know? Right. So, so think about it here. Uh, we've just denied your, let's say it's a badge about writing mm -hmm. and you've just had it denied because uh, this piece of writing was not better than your last piece. Cause that's the standard, right? It, did, did you improve? It's not whether Jesse's a better writer than Jeff, or it's mm -hmm. not some rubric about what 12 year olds should be able to do. It's an improvement. And well, all you would have to do is bring your last piece of writing in this one and put them side by side and argue your case. And you would have, you know, basically two fires to put next to each other. And yeah. you would be able to argue, my sentence structure is better in this one. My mm -hmm. word choice is better. And okay. frankly, if you make that argument well, you're going to win. I mean, you're going to overturn the appeal. Now, what usually happens is Jeff or Jesse wrote blah, 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 blah. And it's just obviously mailed in. And you don't even have an appeal, right? I mean, it's not even, yeah. some of them are these close calls. And if you get better at writing every week, a year later, you are an incredible writer. And these young people, they've never had anyone teach them math, not one minute of writing, not one minute of anything. And they're beautiful writers, and all of them that care to go through calculus. I mean, yeah, they just don't. And, it, and by the way, it doesn't take that much time. The amount of time and energy, they, 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 I think they move at about a three times rate is in normal places. And they have lots of free time, which is incredible. Yes, I mean, this all sounds fascinating. One of the reasons I wanted to have you on here with, you know, the, mono, the usually it's a Montessori framework, but I think a lot of this in terms of Montessori could probably gain from particularly the peer feedback and the ability to kind of, because in Montessori, there's a lot of, especially with the older children, what you're mainly focused on in this, in this case, but um, is that there's a lot of, I'm developing my day, I'm directing my day. So there's a lot of similarities, but I think some of the, the, in, explicit peer review type elements of Acton might be great to kind of integrate into some of the Montessori elements because I don't think there's explicit or to this level. Um, yeah. The thing that I would, what I would say, and I'm very curious is, so what Montessori, what she did, which I think is the, I wouldn't say the genius, but one of the biggest genius elements is that she built into these materials uh, um, a control of error, which basically yeah. means you know, at the end of this, you can see for yourself based on the material, let's say a, a, as a young child, a peg doesn't fit into a hole. Like you don't right. need a teacher to come by, hey, that peg doesn't fit, the child can see it. So a, as much as possible, what I, you know, educationally and pedagogically for me, I wanna see how much of that can we do all the way up to us as adults, where literally you don't need anybody else and when you need somebody else, it's only because you've got some type of product or service that's going to be aiding other people that you've kind of put these other elements together and created something. Yeah. Then you need a lot of feedback. But I just, 
if there's any way to make materials that don't require adult or other person feedback, that's the ideal for me, or that's where you want to focus. So I don't know how much of that is in act and in terms of just learning content, like that they could get feedback for themselves directly. Did I get this or not? Well, I mean, and, and, and really that's all we do. Um, and, and I'd say, I want to make the distinction here at a preschool age or early elementary, acting looks almost identical to Montessori with just a little more heroes, hero stories put in. So I'm speaking really now of middle school and up, you know, later, later elementary, middle school and up when they're ready, they want more complex, more diverse things than the Montessori manipulables could give you. I mean, because we would use all of that early, just, just like we're in Montessori. What I think the internet gives you now is the ability to find these recipes and these examples for yourself, for us to curate them or for you to curate them as a learner. And you can begin to build what you just described, which would look like early Montessori um, materials, but you can build your own kit because there's lots of, of YouTubes and recipes in the world to show you how to do something. I could never fix a toilet before YouTube, right? Now I even I'm in there, but I even I can fix a toilet. So to young people, that's just natural. You just get on YouTube yeah. and figure it out. And so that's what we're doing is giving them a framework to go do that with and to figure yeah. it out on their own. Without the internet and all these examples to curate from, it would never work. Yeah. I and I can't agree more. I just, you just made me think of a time when I was a traditional school teacher and um, this one child, I was thinking he, was, he wasn't he was paying attention. This was that old school classic. And I was like, you know, if you if you don't put that pencil away or something like this, you know, you're not going to be able to watch the, the video with the rest of the class, you know, this type of thing. I mean, it's sad to even say it, but that was very old school. Um, but it was, I'll never forget. He's like, what's the big deal? I could just go home and watch it on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jeff, it was so good, Jeff. And this was during the times, let me tell you, when YouTube was just starting. So yeah. it was like, I wasn't even aware of what he was like really getting at, you know? So well, uh, I, I don't want to sound holier than now because we, even today, 10 years in, mm -hmm. Laura and I, or a guide and I, or one of the owners, acting owners, we'll, we'll have some problem we're trying to solve and we'll spend a day talking about it. And then we just go ask one of the young people. Yeah. And they, they got the answer. And so so yep. even now, and we just kick ourselves, we just wasted a day of our lives. If we just gone and asked and listened, they knew the next YouTube or the next tool or the yep. next way to solve it inside the studio. They And I'm not kidding. They are always better than we are. And yet our pride makes us want to solve the problem. Yep. And I think at a fundamental level, that's why I think we connect, or at least for me, I connect with you is because of this sense of just, children or young people can teach us things that we just have no clue of. And it's just, I mean, I even think, Jeff, when all this occurred, I was talking to a lot of, te when all this coronavirus stuff started, I was talking to so many teachers and administrators and they were scrambling. And I understand the feeling because I would be scrambling, but oh, yeah. it was scrambling to create new content over the internet to send to children, to send to parents. And I was just blown away that the first thing they didn't, thing to do was, I mean, first, even ask the parents, how are you feeling right now at home? Because they're, you know, a lot of these parents have never been at home for this much time. So that's one thing. But the second thing is, why don't you talk to the children themselves? You know, like, so it was, I, and I, I just decided I did a podcast with, you know, there's a Montessori school that had a junior high. And I said, let me just talk with the students. I'm curious what they're thinking about it all. Yeah. But it's, I, I think what you said is sometimes like, well, I'm the teacher. I'm supposed to do everything. I got to get everything. And it's like, Involve the children. They have answers that we might not ever have expected, you know? So, yeah. so I'm with you. No, but, you know, but, but I still make, but, I, but look, I still make the mistake 10 years in all the time. Oh, I mean, I don't, I'm not, I'm not listening to myself, right? Um, I, I, I'm telling you, I mean, the, the whole thing with this podcast, Jeff, funny enough, is that we're growing right alongside the children. Like, that's my whole thing. Because I am with you. I've been doing this over 15 years in education. I tell people, they'll write me and I'll be like, oh, you got upset with the child? Uh, that still happens to me every now and again. Like, yeah. even though I know I, sh I shouldn't, I shouldn't be. But it's like, you never know. So, you know, Jeff, on that note, I'm curious. Is there anything, you know, in terms of we, we've learned things in life and maybe we've kind of shed the, the old for, for some things. Is there anything in your life, this might not immediately be connected with 
maybe children's development, I think it is, um, that you used to really believe strongly, this is this yeah. is something I believe is true, but, and then it changed. You learned something, somebody taught you something, you're like, man, I, I was wrong, and I gotta change. Is there anything like that in your life? Yeah, absolutely, and, and it connects to this. Um, so I, I was a pretty smart kid. And, you know, IQ wise, and, you know, so I, I had good analytical processing speed, you know, something that would look good on an SAT. And mm -hmm. I graduated valedictorian, a class of about 800 in a small West Texas, you know, town. Wow. Um, you know, so I was pretty smart. And, and so I thought, and I went through college and did fine. And then I went to the Harvard Business School. And it didn't take me about two weeks being there to realize there were people so much smarter than I was. You know, and, and, and when I'd been coming up, I had met people smarter than I was, but I could outwork them, right? So I could either outwork you or outsmart you. And I was pretty, you know, I might not be number one, but I'd be up there pretty hot. Mm -hmm. I got there. There were people I could have worked 48 hours a day and not be. And there yeah. were people that were willing to work 48 hours a day. I thought I worked hard. So I came through that and it, and it occurred to me, I better specialize in something. And it better not be the something all the really mm -hmm. smart guys were going into. <laughs> I wasn't going to be very successful. So that was the beginning of what I really learned at Acton, which was, I, we said it before earlier, but IQ matters. And it's good to have high IQ. But we've got all sorts of evidence that when you look at the impact of IQ, which is all an SAT test is, of course, that impact on college is about a 0.4 correlation. And the impact of college on life is about a 0.4. Well, you have to square both of those, you know, and then ask how correlated they are. IQ is probably 10 to 15 percent correlated with success. And so what I've learned is that lesson, that it's not about IQ. And then the second part is it's not about prestige. It's not about having Harvard Business School next to your name. And I think the big divide happening in the world right now is between people seeking prestige that is becoming emptier and emptier, particularly yeah. with college degrees, and people who are seeking competence. And competence is going to win in probably any field that's not politics or the law. I mean, there are still places where prestige matters more, but not many. And so my yeah. lesson is really competence over prestige. IQ is nice, but not even close to determinative. Not, it doesn't matter. Grit, grit beats IQ every time. And character and grit overwhelm IQ. Yeah. You know, there, what you just said at, and I can't agree more in terms of competence and finding a skill that you actually can do well and really honing that skill. Um, there was an article I read a few years back. It's like six harsh truths or something like that. And it's, I mean, it's pretty edgy, but he gave this example. I think it's great of, you know, you say your, your wife or a child is on the street and they're dying and somebody comes and he's like, somebody help me help me. And somebody comes over and the guy says, Oh, I'll, I'll do this. And you look up at him and you say, what makes you able to do this? And the guy's like, oh, well, I'm a nice person. And I, you know, I have a bunch of friends and, and you're looking, I'm like, are you, and the only thing you want to know is, can this guy perform the act that's going to save your wife? Can he get the yeah. job done? So I, yeah. I can't agree with you more. And in this world right now, particularly social media, of how many fans do you have? How many shows have you been on in the real world outside of, likes and loves and shares social media, it only matters, can you save this woman? Can you do the job? And in my mind, it's thinking what we're talking, I'm curious, you know, ultimately long range success, do you enjoy that work? Right, no, no, because, you, you love it enough to keep doing it. And by the way, you do, to me, you, you, you go to the top of this, of this pecking order or hierarchy, not to get rich. I mean, you can do it for that mm -hmm. and that's okay. I'm not gonna, but, it's really because the people at the top of the hierarchy get the interesting problems. Yeah. You need to work with other interesting people, right? It attracts, yeah. you don't have to go chase opportunities when you're really good at something. You have to sort and prioritize opportunities because there's too many of them. So the yeah. reason you're good at something, people say, well, you know, this is all about extrinsic rewards and getting rich. It's like, no, 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 no. It's all about interesting people and opportunities. Now, I'm 100% that way. I would say the other thing we do at Acton is we do a lot of 360 peer reviews. And we're asking people, you know, is Jesse warm-hearted and tough-minded? Because most of us are one or the other, and we need to work on the one where we're weak. Mm -hmm. And I bring that up because if your child is dying, 
you want the surgeon, the trauma surgeon right there. But over time, you want the trauma surgeon that can work with other people in the ER to build a culture that, you know, works and is pleasant to work in. And so I, you know, there is this instantaneous and even long term get great at a skill. And then there's this whole part about being able to work with people and how irascible can you be and still be accepted. And the real magic of acting is that plus the character. I mean, it's developing yeah. this ability to get along and really decide I'm an irascible guy. I'm not actually a really nice guy. I pay a price for that. How big a price am I willing to pay before I'll actually be kinder and gentler? Yeah. And, and yeah. I might need to work on that. That's, yeah. that, you know, getting back to errors or difficulties yeah, I need to cause, overcome. Because yeah. roaming the streets looking for someone who's dying as a trauma technician, you know, gets kind of lonely. I yeah. really have that skill, want to work with the best in the world at the best ER. And to do that, I do need to have some of these other soft skills. If all I have are those, I'm just a talker. I can't help. I, in fact, I'll get yeah. rejected from the good ER. I'll just go to the ER where all people do is talk. Yeah. And I'm, and again, I, I it's good that you're highlighting that because for me, this, this I think it was uh, six harsh truths or whatnot. It was a slant. And I think it's a slant that's needed more today than ever that I think of character as, yeah, you, if, if you're mean to your wife, you hate, you know, you're, you're a mean individual out on the street or you're just rude to people, you're disrespect, you're a racist, you're this or that, that's not going to aid you in life and it's not going to help your community. But today's slant, I think a huge part of character is being able to succeed at real practical things and building up skill. Yep. So I'm I'm using it as a slant, but I'm so with you that if all you could do is like you're really good at basketball, but you're an ass to everyone you meet, yeah. that's I don't I don't even want to meet that. But that's why I think our heroes actually, if you take somebody like Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant, they weren't jerks. Right. The top the top right. heroes are not that type of person. Um, they, so. they were humans. They made mistakes. Yeah. You know, we forgive them, and and they overcame. But they weren't just complete, well, you know, and some people actually can become heroes and be complete jerks. But when you listen yeah. to the price they pay for that, it's too yeah. high. A price. It's too high a price. So I, I think this is an and it's like intrinsic and extrinsic goals. People fight about that all the time. It's like you need both. If you don't think you've been yeah. need both, you've never run an organization. You have to yeah. have both. Yep. Yeah. And that's, I, you know, and I've, I think we talked about this at some, but the extrinsic and intrinsic, it's like a dichotomy. You know, you've got one group that's like, hey, you're not going to survive in America unless you have extrinsic rewards. And then the other side, like, it, the extrinsic rewards mean nothing. Let's just be peaceful. And, and it's like both of those on their own are deathly. They're right. deathly. Well, so I'm with you. It's one of the reasons I love the hero's journey, because if you really watch the hero's journey, it's not an individualistic thing, right? It's always taken in community. They're always mentors and they're running part. They're people who go alongside you. They're fellow travelers. There's people. You, so it's always a journey in community. It's because you can have the same argument, the individuals versus the group. And it's like, which is more important? It's a silly question. They're both yeah. critical. It's just yeah. when do you focus on one or the other and not, you know, do you do both? So so anyway, I, I, I just I, I love talking to you. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm really enjoying this. I mean, I hope the audience enjoys this. We're going we're going a long time, but you know what? We're, let's see what happens. We'll get the feedback from the audience, you know, because I'm enjoying it. Well, so they maybe, turn it I mean, off. That's, that's the beauty of today's world. I know <laughs> they can turn it off. I like that. <laughs> well, please don't turn it off if you're out there, unless it's really bad. But keep it going. But I like that. I like that point because in the end, if you don't like some something somebody's saying, I had to learn this for myself. Just turn it off. Just turn the, the dang thing off. Um, but, you know, kind of closing up here, let's let's yep. get at some maybe something because you're a parent as well. So we've kind of been really focused on education. I think it's it's applicable whether you're, you know, to, you're a parent with a child or you're a teacher with a child. It's children and human beings developing. But yep. as a parent, was there something that that you did with you said you have two two children? Oh, we have three. We have a daughter who's now uh, 24, a son who's 18 and a son who's 17. Okay. So with those three, is there just maybe something you could throw out to the audience that maybe we can learn from that went really well with one or all of them? And then maybe something not so well and what we can learn from it. Yeah. I, you know, most of the things that went well, I guess one of my lessons as a parent is 
you can screw up your children, but they're likely to become who they're going to become if you don't screw them up. So, <laughs> you know, it's 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 beholden on us not to screw them up and then to accept who they're becoming. And, and I really mean that because I think I, I, if you try to fight against who they're trying to become, you're going to lose. I mean, if you're if you're uh, I've got a son who's uh, a friend who's a deep, deep friend and, and his son, he's found out is transsexual. And this is a guy who was mildly homophobic and could never imagine that. Right. Oh, and, but he loves his son so much that he's gone yeah. through this transformation of understanding. And so, the th you know, I, I think we did a lot of things wrong. And I always tell my kids, you're going to be in therapy for something. So, you know, just <laughs> I, I accept that. You know, I I know I've screwed something up and you're going to have a father issue and you know, just get over yeah. it because that's just going to happen. Um, yeah. But I think that kind of attitude of just offering them choices and consequences, you know, and, 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 and sticking to those consequences, but loving who they're becoming, it's hard. And, you know, you make mistakes. I think that's one of the things, thanks to Laura, we've done very, very well. And I give her the credit there. Um, the thing we we screwed up that didn't bite us but could have is mm -hmm. we didn't keep enough controls on technology. If I had it to do over again, I would fight to the, I would fight as long as I could fight and then two more years to not give a cell phone. And mm -hmm. I would have very strict limits on, you know, access. I'm not worried about them surfing the internet for porn. I'm just mm -hmm. worried about the addictedness of games. I was very laissez-faire about that. Now nah, they'll work it out. And, and our kids did. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they managed through it. But the more I've seen, the more I know about that. I would have set very, very strict limits on on interactions with addictive technology. And I think we dodged a bullet there and got lucky that our children just didn't have the, you know, the makeup that that attracted mm -hmm. them too much. We could have gotten in a lot of trouble there. And I mean, that's incredibly fascinating hearing coming from you where there's a, obviously a lot of technology with Acton. So this is, you're basically, it's kind of like a freedom within limits type approach that you're trying to say might be better. Um, it, at home. You know, it's interesting. Yeah, it, it's interesting though about Acton. Our, you know, if you take away when you're using the internet for research, for real, and you mm -hmm. take away when you're using a laptop to type, because we're going to write on something, you take those mm -hmm. out of the picture. Um, we're on. They were probably only on technology an hour and a half a day. Oh wow! So most of this okay. is no. Most of this is very hands-on. Um, it's it's building real things like building a you know, a real city and powering it with lights. And so, so it's, it's very much hands-on, interactive, in groups, doing things, having discussions. Um, Technology is an aid to that, but, but we're, we're much less um, technology intensive than, than most traditional schools. So, so basically what you're getting at is this kind of like, I don't know, I don't even know the games, but you know, like Angry Birds or something like that, which was the huge one years ago. You're just saying, be careful of the excess of children on these type of things. And like maybe Nintendo for me when I was younger, I don't know if you, what you were doing, but. Uh, uh, and unfor unfortunately, as an adult, my children pointed out that I was addicted to angry birds and I had to take it off of my iPad. <laughs> Look at that. Just <laughs> and, 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 you know, they pointed out that, that perhaps it wasn't healthy how much I was playing it. And, the, and, it, and it, they felt badly afterwards because the moment they said that I deleted it, and I never picked it up again. Wow. I, they were right. I literally, I picked it up and I said, you're a hundred percent right. And I deleted it and they go, well, dad, we were just kidding. We were just, and I said, no, 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 you're a hundred percent right. What a waste of time. And I stopped it. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, maybe I'm so worried about it cause I'm, I may be the one that's addicted. But. Yeah. But so, I mean, in talking about just the idea of maybe character is destiny, how do you feel as an adult, you were able to just be like, I'm done. Because, I mean, that's that's the ideal with a lot of people, whether it's weight loss, whether it's social media, whether it's, you know, being a, being a jerk in life. Like, if we could just turn it off like that, that's fantastic. So what allows you to do that, I guess, at least with Angry Birds? Well, because I think I'm more tough-minded. I'm more left-brained. I'm more, you know, naturally I'm that way. And, and mm -hmm. that's why, back to the point of acting, you need to be in a community with the right kinds of feedback where... I can perhaps help you by holding the line and you can help me by being more warm hearted and we can learn from each other because, you know, you need to go, we need to both be able to turn those on and off when appropriate. So, so, mm -hmm. you know, I need to say, Hey, Jesse, here's the bar. I love you, but that's the bar. I can't move the bar because I love you so much. Mm -hmm. That's different than uh, junior. You need to move the rocks again. <laughs> here's the bar. And it's different than, 
oh, it's okay if you can't make it or you don't try hard. You know, I love you anyway. That's not love, right? And so yeah. I think the ability to do both is the thing we all struggle with. I just happen to be good at the, oh, I'm going to turn it off part. But but even with that, I got addicted. I mean, so, you know, habits are a very powerful thing. Yeah, no, no doubt. Well, great. Well, this is this has been awesome. I know. I mean, I, I think I could continue going on and on, but I think it's going to be problematic yeah. potentially. Yeah. I understand. So, um, understand. Is there anything is there anything real quick you want to throw out before we we hop off? Um, I mean, we can obviously do this another time, but yeah. I think we're going over an hour now. So we got to no, be careful. Okay. I want to leave you with one last story. And this is one that impacted me a lot. And it only happened a few months ago. Um, we have these owners from all over the world. You know, we have 13,000 now people who've applied to open an acting academy. And wow. Congr congratulations, by the way, I got to take a moment. Just congratulate. That's huge. Yeah. It's amazing. And they're, and they're terrific. We have 271, you know, terrific founders of actors and they're all running them all over the world. And we've tended to shy away actually from traditional educators because they don't do well and we don't know why yet. So that's not a prejudice. It's just an empirical fact, but we mm -hmm. gave this one man who was such a wonderful learner and educator um, and wanted to build an actin for his own children in England, we gave him one of the actins and he came to orientation. So he spent all day around the Eagles and he spent all day with us. And we went around at the end of the day and asked people in one breath to say what they learned or what they were going to do differently. And this gentleman said, it is as if I were a tiger expert, perhaps the greatest tiger expert in the world, but I had only studied tigers in cages. Mm, they, for the first time, I have seen tigers in the wild, and I see what magnificent creatures tigers can be, and I realize I know nothing about tigers at all. Wow. That's insane. That summarizes 10 years of the acting experience for me, and that children are capable of doing far more than we've ever imagined, and our jo job is to give them the tools and turn them free to learn through the school of hard knocks and through very difficult things to become who they're going to become. Man, that that is, and it just, you know, it hits me that Maria Montessori did the analogy of children actually being in, in not literally, but like a, the slaves. Because, yeah. you know, back in the slave times, when people said, oh, these people could never excel, it's because, yeah, you've had them chained up. No, no doubt they can't excel when you're chaining them up. So I think that is that's a great analogy. So yeah, it's a good ending. I, I think that was worth the last few minutes. So thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jesse. I look forward to continuing the friendship. Yeah, yeah. The friendship and the talking. I really appreciate it.